and, and the need for practitioners across the state who um, don't understand it to somehow really ex understand that and start doing that when needed. So those are a couple of things I was wondering if you could comment on. Yeah, so there's uh, been legislation and I can't, I think it's uh, HB 211, oh no, HB 116, um, that says that um, uh, jails and other facilities have to uh, provide all three medications for uh, opioid use disorders um, in, in, uh, in jails in the state of Maryland. Um, as it stands right, so the state certainly recognizes and we have a lot of our partners on the criminal justice side uh, certainly um, appreciate the importance of uh, treating people who have opioid disorders um, prior to being released from um, jails and prisons because the overdose rate is 12 times higher um, for a period of time once they leave, um, once they leave that environment. Uh, and so uh, as it stands right now, we have about four um, uh, uh, prisons that are, that are using medications uh, for opioid use disorders, not all of the medications they're working on, trying to get all of the medications on board. I believe by the end of this year, we should have six uh, facilities that have um, uh, medications for opioid use disorders uh, uh, behind the walls. Um, the other thing that we're doing now is um, through our harm reduction efforts, uh, harm reduction arm on the public health side of things, uh, is that um, uh, probation and parole officers are going to be educated in um, the use of uh, naloxone and will be providing naloxone uh, and asking about substance use um, and uh, making naloxone available to um, the people who they are monitoring in the community um, so that they have access to um, naloxone as well. So, so we're looking at it kind of behind the walls, continuing to push for uh, support and funding for um, bringing medications to all the jails, all three medications, FDA approved for opioid disorders, and then also making sure that those uh, who are monitoring people in the community know at least um, how to engage in a healthy conversation about substance related disorders and providing resources to prevent overdose. That's terrific, thank you so much. Does any, if there's anyone that commented yesterday about uh, the topics that Dr. Jones just addressed. Uh, if you want to open your mic, then uh, raise your hand. Um, Melanie Sense, are you? I know that you're on. I don't know if you're actively listening, but I'd love to have you talk about transportation as a huge barrier. And um, you know, I think that's kind of a low-hanging fruit kind of thing that state folks can can actually. If they become aware of some examples, it can be really helpful. And that happened in, when we had our West Virginia town hall and the commissioner just said, I need that address. I can have someone go there. I can approve a route uh, you know, adjustment because those kinds of things um, can be taken care of. So Melanie, are you there? Yes, I sure, I sure am. Hi, how you doing? Great. Um, Great, and you know, uh, thank you so much for wonderful presentations. Um, but ab absolutely, definitely a huge barrier. And I know that we give out bus tokens, and we, as a matter of course, during our intake, um, you know, assess transportation needs and then take appropriate steps. So we might help uh, with a reduced fare application um, because participation in an outpatient substance abuse program does qualify people for reduced fare. Um, so we we help with that. But absolutely, I think that just in in medicine in general. Um, you know, people often frame patients as resistant or, you know, apathetic towards their health because they don't make it to, you know, what is clear to the provider to be a very important specialist appointment. But, you know, if the specialist appointment is across town, um, you know, and you, uh, you can't get to it and you maybe you like don't really understand why it is important or it wasn't fully explained to you or, or really any factor associated with that. Uh, but transportation can be a huge barrier. And I think that we need to change how we view um, those kind of things, we uh, you know, uh, in medicine, it is tend to be viewed as resistant. But you know, really, people are obviously always doing the best that they can. Um, you know, so absolutely, I think that that's uh, hugely important. And thank you all so much for an awesome presentation. Um, you know, learned a lot, really useful information. Thank you all so much, Dr. Worthy. Did you do you think you could talk about sort of how? some of the programs you're responsible for might have a role in overcoming transportation issues? Sure, so 
One of the things that has really struck me in the conversation that we've had over the last two days, and it's been so rich, is just this idea of breaking down the silos. Um, several times I've heard, and it, it really struck me uh, as an early childhood person, I'm so centered on young children and this thought about, you know, moms are humans and have needs and they're people. <laughs> not just the vessel. Someone said, not just the vessel for the baby. <laughs> and I thought, oh, that's true. And I'm, I'm a mother of three. <laughs> and so this idea of collaborating between a quote unquote adult services and child services, I think is one of the ways that really moves that forward that we're often usually thinking in a lens that isn't inclusive of, of a two generational approach of the entire family of what does mom need for the children and need for herself? What does the family need? And something as simple but profound as transportation is so important. I've talked to uh, folks in different counties and in some counties, transportation is a really, is a major barrier and, and really making appointments and making things uh, easy to be reached, doing things that are clustered, what things can be done that mom needs and also that baby needs in the same place or multiple appointments happening uh, in succession so that there isn't this need to go from one place to another place to another place is a really small, I, I think, you know, small gesture, but huge in just managing the number of appointments um, that our families have. And so really thinking about how do we collaborate across, uh, across our disciplines, this interdisciplinary approach, cross-disciplinary approach that we begin to work together and make things a less of a burden on the people who are accessing services, if you will, in our coordination and collaboration. Thank you so much. And speaking of the village, again, uh, in this group, we had people with 75 different position titles in our approximately 250, uh, well, out of our 370 registrants, 11 states and uh, the country of India <laughs> had, had some folks participate. So, um, you know, I think um, it just speaks to the diversity of the audience and how important that is. Um, I'd like to call on, I don't know, if, I don't see any raised hands, so I'm just going to pick on people and hope that it's okay. Uh, oh, Julie, um, oh, oh, go, go ahead. Um, if, if it's all right, oh, I just wanted to um, add on um, to Dr. Worthy's comment as well, and then um, to um, the previous comment um, of um, just appreciating um, the, the challenges and really that collaboration partnership approach, and then um, really thinking about the family. Um, and I also um, really appreciate, um, Dr. Bennett, the, the slides that you've provided of just really on of just the innovative ways to also provide the care as well. Um, so one thing that came out was um, the mobile clinic, so really bringing um, care to um, where, where families are um, as well, and then telehealth. Um, and so in a way, it looks as if there's menus of options, um, but also knowing that to build these systems, it takes, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes funding, um, and to make them sustainable also takes um, just as much effort and funding as well. But um, just wanted to thank everyone for their innovative ideas. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Julie, can, oh, go ahead, Sarah. Um, I just wanted to piggyback and highlight one of the, the programs that I mentioned, Healthy Steps, our integrative care zero to three program in both family medicine and pediatrics, because Medicaid did recently add it as um, a, a potential different funding uh, source for its sustainability. But when I reflect upon the basic needs that you're describing that this group has brought up, you know, it's so nice to see in the family medicine clinic, uh, the mother is able to bring the, the child and there's a lactation specialist there. Uh, we have uh, groups and so the, the mother can participate both in uh, therapeutic bonding groups as well as at times there's the access to WIC uh, is right there as well. And so I know personally having talked to many of the women and individuals involved, like that is the key. Just what everyone is saying as far as making it accessible 
making it uh, meaningful in a way that they don't feel like it's additional burdens when they already have it rough. Every, you know, it's hard to parent as we keep a big theme throughout this. And so I really applaud the state's support of uh, integrated programs like that. Terrific. We have a raised hand. If I had a gold star, I'd put it through the internet on Erica Brandt's head. So uh, <laughs> Erica. Hi, my name's Erica. Um, I have the honor of working with the START program, which is the initiative for Maryland. It stands for sobriety treatment and recovery teams. And um, I'm the family mentor. So I'm a peer trained in child welfare and I get paired with my social worker and we get cases referred to us where substance use disorders like the primary risk factor um, and there's children zero to five in the home. And um, it's just been such a blessing to, to work in this field, but just to piggyback off of what everyone is saying. And from my own experience, um, a lot of times IOP or some kind of professional treatment is required um, for the parent. So any, and I don't even know if this is possible, but any kind of um, IOP program that is like, um, parent friendly <laughs> would be an amazing gift um, to provide because I'd say a majority of the women in, that are having struggles with Department of Social Services are struggling um, with the substance use disorder. And, and then the requirements don't, um, like there, it just, it almost feels more like a hurdle than a help at times and there are definitely things being done and put in place to like help this um but i just think a program that provided the treatment care along with like the regular um family needs and and parenting needs could be like a huge help some kind of day program yeah, thank you so much, Erica. I see a couple of folks opened their cameras that look to me like they want to ask a question. Joyce, Russell, are you? There we go. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for this opportunity to participate. Uh, I've been working with women and children pregnant and postpartum through initiative from the State Department, but I'm working with Prince George's County health department. But one of the things I think Dr. Jones touched on was um, providing the three types of medications for the women who are coming home or that are, are still incarcerated. Um, I, I, looking into ways that we can uh, kind of help with a re-entry situation with women that are coming home from jails and are skeptical or untrusting in terms of connecting with programs that would assist them with um, treatment. Um, a lot of them are afraid to be honest about what their situation is, how they're feeling, if they still have some type of mental health issue going on prior to even going in, um, will not continue the health care that they need when they're released. And a lot of times that ends in, you know, a fatal situation um, that we can try to catch them before they're coming out. Some type of way where we can acclimate or con connect with the women that are returning to the community in such a way where they are a little more trusting of the entities that are in place to help and not hurt. Yeah, thank you so much, Joyce. That was really important comment. I appreciate it. Um, Duffine Jackson, I saw, you, saw that you uh, opened your camera. Did you want to make a comment? No, I don't. It, it's just seemed like I can't get my picture in, but it, the information has been so informative and I had enjoyed this whole um, conference and um it's very needed thank you thank you and rebecca same for you i saw you opened your camera did you want me to call on you um not particularly but i'll speak 
Um, I would just say like in Dorchester Detention Center, something they did that helps with um, getting to meet with those individuals that have that substance use disorder is the SBIRT screenings, um, which is what I started doing here three years ago. Um, and to have since become licensed and done more clinical stuff as well. But having the expert screening in the detention center and, and building that rapport and explaining confidentiality and why I'm doing what I'm doing and how we can help and, and uh, you know, the healthcare standpoint. Um, so just one intervention that places can start to implement. Yeah, great. I'm glad you. I'm glad that's happening there. Fantastic, Susan. Same same thing. I, I see that you have your I can't mic. Figure on. out how to raise my hand. <laughs> oh, that's okay. You go to reactions, which is on the bottom oh, right okay. under your chat. That's okay. Okay, we got you. Um, yeah, hi. I'm with um, the Area Health Education Center West, located in Cumberland. Um, I wanted to speak. For, we were involved in a lot of initiatives related to the op opioid issue, including NAS. And these are federally funded programs. And I put in the chat, and we'd love to connect around. Um, I'm, I've connected with Max uh, through other people, Kelly. But um, one of the things that we've done in the Allegheny County Detention Center is create a reentry center. And we worked with the reentry coordinator. Um, we actually got some funding for part of her time to create the center. And we have a, peer rec a certified peer recovery specialist and a community health worker that go into the jail and work with folks before they're released. And then they help them, you know, you know, gain the resources they need when they come out and they continue to support them and connect them to other source, you know, services and things like that. But we also have um, an NAS grant that we are trying to build coalition around. Um, the situation is pretty, uh, substance um, affected newborns pretty serious in Allegheny County, as you probably know. Um, so we'd love to connect and Garrett County is part of the NAS program. We'd love to connect with folks. Um, we'd, so, and we'd love to have provider education and um, just more connection with it. It's like a big disconnect around like the community-based organizations like us and the providers um, and then the state entities and all that. So Susan, one of the, one of the highlights of those quarterly follow-up calls is when we have technical assistance centers and uh, organizations that are being paid Federal, federally to mm -hmm. provide free support. So we would love for you to be a part of the solution set along with other technical assistance centers that you know SAMHSA has that I know you already work with. Uh, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see you on October, what's the day? October 14th at 10 a.m. You might. Um, we're available. <laughs> so we're, we're bumping up on, we have two minutes left. I love pushing the envelope on all things. Uh, but I feel like if there's two more people that can each make one minute, one minute comment a piece, I'd rather do that than say anything else. Um, anyone else who's been in the training that wants to have a chance to speak to the panelists? I will. Go ahead, um, Emily. My name's Emily Bladen and I work um, with the Home Builders Program in Allegheny County in Maryland. And um, I wanted to just kind of pick your brains a little bit about how we can reach out to individuals um, with substance use disorders who are pregnant in the community before they get to us. So we've talked a lot about the ways that clinicians and, and um, practitioners can work with individuals who co already come into our offices who already have referrals for. But what is your idea about being able to reach out to those individuals who are too scared um, or too deep into addiction to feel like they can even come in for treatment at this point in time. Any particular panelist? Anybody who has an idea. Okay. This is Shelly, I can go first. And um, I think, you know, one thing that I've heard um, from the from the group here too, of just how important sort of that trusted messenger is. So um, the peer recovery specialist, the community health worker, the, net, um, the community health navigator, um, and then um, how many of you as community-based organizations are already doing the work and how you already have that trusted um, relationship. And um, I think, um, I, I really do think, I think partnering with um, community-based organizations, faith-based institutions, I think these trusted members, um, already in the community and working together 
um, I think to build that trust, um, I think that's, um, you know, that, that is um, one way um, in addition to all the other solutions that were brought up today as well. Well, email, uh, me, email me, Emily, please. I will just jump in also to say that I think, you know, my other hat that I wear is I have the privilege of directing our child psychiatry access program and we work with pediatricians. And I think something we all have to get better at doing is making discussions about substance use, trauma. We have to make screening for, for everything very routine. And we have to make it very normal that we ask questions and we talk about things that I think we often feel are too taboo to talk about. And so I think working with our pediatricians, working with dentists, right, to just ask a question and to bring it up. And a, a very pop culture reference or sort of uh, last night on the Ravens and Raiders game, the, the Raiders celebrated two players for being in recovery and being back in the game. And right, like I think we just all have to do a better job of talking about. They also talked about the first openly gay NFL player. We just all have to do a better job, I think, about removing the stigma and uh, making topics taboo. So I think thinking about how we do a lot of promotion um, and prevention activities and making it, it happen everywhere. And then there are more opportunities, I think, for folks uh, to talk to a trusted member. Um, so I think that's another approach we can consider. Okay, well, we're at time. I don't want to get in trouble for having contractors work past their appointed hour. Uh, I do think if you, uh, I know Deborah, now I see other people open their mics and they want to speak. Mm -hmm. um, but just go ahead and add to the chat any, any last minute uh, info. We've, caught, we've captured all the chat. We're going to be distilling that. We're gonna stay in touch. And um, I didn't leave any time at all for Kay Connors, who of all the people <laughs> I've ever worked with, I've, out of the 12 or 13, I've lost count courses we've put on. She is the, she's easier to work with, more responsive and sort of smarter and with the best intuition of anyone I've worked with in years. Uh, so Kay, anytime, my hat is off to you. Anytime you want Region 3 to engage, we are at your beck and call. Oh, Jean, that's the nicest thing anyone's ever said. Thank you so much. It's really it's been true. a pleasure. And I just want to thank our team and our panelists. And of course, Jean and the incredible faculty um, that presented today. We want to make sure that everyone also gets their CMEs and CEUs. So you'll see that there's a, a link in the chat. But also, everything you need will be on the landing page. So um, if you miss it, you can always go there. You can always email Sylvia or I. Um, we're happy to connect. And we hope that you can join us on um, October the 14th at 10 o'clock. And I put that link in as well. And we'll send it out to you as well. And, and Dr. Jones, you get the last word. And, and this, you know, it's not just symbolic that Dr. Jones and the rest of the panelists are here. These are get it done people. And um, just like the participants here are have the job satisfaction, no one can even understand because they're taking care of individuals who need only what they can deliver, uh, which is you know respectful, equitable, informed care. So, Dr. Jones. Uh, again, I just want to thank everyone for, for being here. Thank you, Jean uh, and team, for uh, convening and providing this opportunity uh, for us to come together to talk about something that's so important so that we can make a difference in many more lives and help many more women and help many more families and, and the communities that they all belong to. So I just want to express my appreciation to each of you. Uh, and thank you to all of you for all the work that you do every day, uh, taking care of the community and taking care of those who come to you uh, for care uh, and for continuing to just grow grow your own knowledge base so that you can provide better care so that we can truly make sure that we are moving evidence-based principles and practices into the community where they belong so we can maximize our collective impacts. So thank you all. Thanks, everybody.